Hey, so, first of all, if you're in the back, why? <laughs> Can you come up here, please? No, we've got some amazing talent up here, myself included, of course, but we have some amazing talent, so please come forward. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna do half hour of, uh, we're gonna run our mouths for half hour, and then probably last half hour, you fine folks are gonna get to ask the questions. How's that sound? I would like to start with, can we get like some excitement in the room first of all? Can we like clap or something? I can't hear you. Yeah! Close enough. So we are internet marketing and before I begin, I want to introduce my fellow panelists. So, starting with Nika. Nika, I'm up from, or I'm down here from Toronto, Canada. I've written five books, and I'm busy doing my own marketing as an independent author. Yeah. Please speak into the microphone, and please give her a round of applause. <laughs> like you mean it! Thank you. Hi, I'm Holly Bryant Simpson. I'm a publicist for Entangled Publishing, which is all romance novels. And previously, I was with Listen Up Audiobooks, which is in Atlanta, so I can tell you all about audiobooks. I'm EJ Stevens. I'm the author of 15 speculative fiction novels, including the Spirit Guide series, the Ivy Granger Psychic Detective series. And really good, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and the Hunter's Guild series. And I'm announcing. DragonCon, my Whitechapel Paranormal Society upcoming Victorian Dreadpunk series, which comes out next year. My <laughs> Hi, I'm Tyra Burton. I'm actually a professor at Kennesaw State University. I wrote a book called Socially Engaged, the author's guide to social media with Jenna Oliver, and I'm here having a good time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elaine Calloway. I write two series. One is Southern Ghosts. And I have four of those books out right now, and the other one is Elemental Fallen Angels, sort of urban fantasy. And there will be five total in those. My next book on that comes out in November. I'm an indie author and have pretty much learned by trial and error what works for social media and what doesn't. And my books sell well every month, so I wanted to come and share. Having a great time. <laughs> What's your ROI? My name is Sasha Ilyevich. I've been published for 17 years. I am the Gentleman Playboy of Romance. I have, I think, 58 titles out, plus a few more coming out this year. And I have agency representation by Marissa Correa Zero Agency. And that's what I'm at. So, let's start with a, a, a quick question. On social media, so we're talking Pinterest, we're talking Facebook, we're talking any of that sort of thing. What is your biggest no-no? You do not do this thing. Uh, oh, uh, Where are we starting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I find it absolutely irksome when other authors direct message me and badger me through Twitter. Read my book, read my book, read my book. And that's all of their Twitter feed, and that's all they have is just, well, they're too aggressive. So, no hard sell. Yeah, slow it down. Uh, my biggest is not knowing your audience. Uh, I focus on historical romance, so most of my <laughs> readers tend to be more 35 to 60, so I'm not going to post things on Snapchat for them. I'm going to focus more on Facebook, a little bit of Instagram, and Twitter. A huge no-no is to respond in any way to negative reviews. This can be threatening to the reviewer, and any opinion is a good opinion. The fact that they read your novel is, that is wonderful. Uh, but don't, don't respond, don't attack them. There have been authors who have followed people, other reviewers on social media and showed up on people's doorstep. This is a huge no-no, just don't respond. Grow a thick skin. Uh, just 
you can be thankful for someone who's giving you a good review, but just do not do not respond and do not interact with, with anyone to do negative reviews. I agree. I think don't feeding the trolls is always a good thing to think about, but there's also don't be a troll. Um, I've actually seen other authors be unkind to somebody about their work, and if you're a writer, if you don't like somebody else's work, you keep your mouth shut because you give, you get what you give. So in my, don't be a troll. Don't respond to the trolls. Um, I'm going to agree with her. Not only the direct messaging, but on Twitter. If you have a book release coming out, if you have any big news. Do not sit there and have your entire feed be, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. It's 99 cents, it's 99 cents, it's 99 cents, without engaging with other people. The biggest thing about Twitter is it's supposed to be engaging. No one, as far as I know, has ever bought a book because someone badgered them. Um, I do have readers on Twitter, but I started a connection first. So you need to have that and not just be pushy. Let's talk about a really sensitive subject right now. Let's discuss politics. How do you folks feel about politics being posted on a feed? I'm Canadian, I'm staying out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was all. Again, I'm going back to knowing your audience. Uh, you have to know what your audience is into. If you have a really socially liberal or socially conservative audience and you are a, a, agree with them, then sure, then you can create a community around that. It depends on what you write and what they read. Always conscious of your audience. I do have a buddy of mine, an author of mine that I've edited, and what she's done with her feed is ask engaging questions that deal with politics still. And granted, most of her supporters are leaning one way or the other, but she's asking the engaging questions. How do you feel about asking the engaging questions? Questions are fantastic because they create interaction with your readers. In, instead of it just being a, a, a one-way conversation, you ask a question and people interact, and then you also get more likes and comments, which boosts the signal on your post and boosts the signal on you and your author platform and your books. And you're, it, it's this wonderful effect that happens, an exponential thing that happens. So questions are fantastic. But I do, when we get on the subject of politics, I prefer it's as part of how I created my social society author platform. I prefer not to be controversial. I, but that's also part of that is that I began in young adult. I write adult now, but I began in young adult, and I really wanted to be sensitive to my readers. We go back to knowing knowing your readers, and I did not want to ostracize any of them, and I also did not want to want to bore them, so I kept that out of my feed. So it's really important to know your audience. In other words, yes. Yes. Yes, target market is everything, and I always talk about knowing your line in the sand, what you will or will not talk about, period, regardless of whether it's political season. Um, if you write for the LGBTQ community, then you're probably going to talk politics, and that's probably okay, because assuming you're writing for them, you're probably pro-LGBTQ. But in general, I, I'm like, you've got to know your audience, and it's probably not the best way to engage full force. Well, what do you mean by that exactly? Because there's there's being an ally online, and then there's also a difference between being an ally in public. So how do you differentiate that? How do you deal with that? You have to know your like. I what I tell my students is I said if you follow me on social media, I don't talk politics. But my sister's gay, so I do talk about LGBTQ rights, and I do support them. I'll say that in person. I'll say that on Facebook. I said it to my 90-year-old mother. So. If my mother could have said it to my 90 year old mother, it's probably okay to say yeah, it. Yeah. That's a really good litmus test. If you can say something to your grandmother or your mother, then it's probably okay to share on, on social media. But if, if you look at, say, sharing something on your Facebook or putting something into your Twitter feed and it would make you uncomfortable to share with those people in your life, then perhaps it may not be a good idea to put that out there. I would agree with that. I'm one of those, no religion, no politics, no nothing. Um, mostly because my audience is very broad. There will be people, there will be people, hello. <laughs> there will be people that, I know that there's different political views in my audience. Most of mine is between like age 30 and 65. So, but I just really, it's just good not to go there and I know even with very close friends, my son-in-law is very, very die-hard on one political side, and I love him, but I get tired of seeing his feet, so <laughs> it's just a matter of knowing your audience, 
say things that are important to you, but I personally just stay away from those two topics. I've had to actually unfriend people because of, even if they're voting my way on social media, I'm just tired of the political, the, the political BS in this season right now. It's tiresome. What do you guys do with that rigmarole? Talk about something else. <laughs> well, there's this lovely thing. It's called unfollow. So yes, I mean, but, but that's, 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 that's stay their friend. So that's, that's Facebook, yeah. Yeah, stay their friend. Click that right arrow. Unfollow them or unfollow like if, if there's a certain group that's posting a lot of stuff from a page, you can actually say I don't want to see anything else from that page, and it will keep your friends sometimes. I'm a really huge fan of lists with social media. Strategically, you can create lists on Twitter or Facebook, and you can I, you can uh, segment out your yep. friends that way. So I tend to segment out um, book people specifically for those um, posts, so I can post anything that's specifically for them and leave them out of other things, and also make sure that I'm dedicating time to interacting with them um, and keeping them engaged with book-related talk rather than anything. So lists can be really, really helpful. Another thing that I know personally that I am uncomfortable with is animal cruelty. And that's another one of those things, like politics, that can make people very uncomfortable. I don't want to see violence against animals in my feed. So It's horrible. It is. It's horrible. So I, I would not want to have something like that going out to my readers either. Uh, and, that, and that is something I, I every single time, I will, I will unfollow. Let's get into the nitty gritty now. Where do you find, ladies, find your most passionate follower base? And why? Oddly, uh, oddly for me, it wound up being on Tumblr. I don't have a lot of, I don't know why that happened, it just did. But I just started connecting with other indie writers, and just started talking and, you know, doing like, book exchanges and you know, exchanging reviews and just talking the process of writing and then suddenly it's just the word is getting out there almost organically, I don't know how. That's, that's, that's fair, yeah. So is it as organically as it grows, is it mostly writers or are you getting readers? I think too? it's both. Both readers and writers. Okay. Everyone's spreading the word for each other so we kind of started up well, yeah, the writers are going to spread the word for themselves and talk about, like I said earlier today, EJ has a series that I have picked up the first book in. I love it. I tweet about it. When I'm at the Cigar Club, I'll talk about it. And then I'll follow her on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. It's important to remember that authors are readers too. We read a lot. So we are part of your audience. I've had a lot of luck in Facebook groups. Um, it's similar to Tumblr, but it, uh, the age is a little bit higher, so it works better for my audience. Um, but they are similar to Tumblr in that it's a community around that specific fandom or interest. Um, and it's more personal because it's not a page in Facebook pages. Uh, Facebook has killed them, basically. They never show up. So if you um, interact with people in groups, you can get your word out there and also connect with your readers a lot more directly. And how do you do that? You join the groups. Um, and yeah, participate obviously. a lot. So there's a lot of them out there that, uh, I mean, you have to ask. You have to ask readers. You have to ask readers where they're talking about it. So get to know your audience personally and find out where they get what they want to read. So sometimes that's going to be groups on Goodreads. Sometimes it's going to be Tumblr communities. Sometimes it's going to be Facebook groups. But you have to get in there and be a person in it. You can't just post, here's my next book. You have to talk to them about the tropes that they love, the tropes that they hate, the things they hate on cover art, just, you know, everything that goes into a book that creates a community around it. Yeah, um, my most dedicated fans have come from Goodreads and from my blog. I have a, a speculative fiction book blog, and I do not do reviews. I feel like it's a conflict of interest at this point in my career, but I do invite other authors to come. Sasha's been on my blog before. It's From the Shadows, and I love to have this opportunity to promote other authors. We cross-pollinate with other readers. We do guest posts and interviews and giveaways, and it's we've actually had three million page views in the seven years that I've been doing this. It helps explain. Now, which blog and, was yeah, so now? Been on it too. <laughs> but which blog is that, so we can all go follow? From the shadows.info. 
I just got done doing a uh, kind of a case study with a well-known author who created a pseudonym. And we wanted to find out which things worked on social media. And the two things we found out is um, Facebook has a very broad demographic. So for my following, Facebook works because I go from everything from college students to 80-year-old writers. But um, for her, starting out, we started Facebook. We could not get any traction there until we did pay. And we got a ton of traction, and we got a ton of more readers doing that with very little money. We were very surprised. But the other thing we found was networking, whether it's in-person networking with authors and getting to know each other and sharing each other, showing the love, as we call it, or networking on something like Tumblr, where there is a huge writer community there. Um, just get to know other writers because they will help if you can connect with them they will help you find an audience as well so that's networking is so huge but in person don't forget in person because in real life helps um, mine has actually come very recently and for those of you that don't know it Facebook pages are pretty much dead Facebook has made it where unless you pay <laughs> which I have done to boost like a book sale or something like that um, not about maybe 10% of the people that like your page will see it. So Facebook pages are really not a great way to get the word out. I had a friend of mine suggest creating a Facebook group as opposed to just joining them. So I've created one for fans of my Southern Ghost series and the key to it, they're very responsive there. More and more people have requested to join. The key thing there is that there is a very passionate audience for haunted things. And we talk not just, buy my book, buy my book, because that's wrong. Um, but we talk haunted houses. There are different Facebook feeds that feature abandoned haunted places that I'll share in that group. And it always gets everybody talking about, oh, I've been to that, or I want to go to that, or whatever. So now, Facebook groups. just as a curiosity, when you're talking about Facebook groups and pages and whatnot, what are we dealing with in terms of, are you paying for that marketing? And if you are, I'm gonna ask you this question, because you, what's your ROI like, and how do you capitalize on your return of investment? I have always made money on the Facebook ads that I've had. I do not know the exact ROI, not even since two nights ago when you asked me that question. Um, or last week. Oh, yes. Oh, well, she I was picking on her about that too. Yes, ago, she, yeah. he was. But um, I am always in the black, and I always keep an eye on my Facebook ads to see. I've done like $5 a day for a certain amount of time. I think the most I've done is $25 a day for about a month, and it was selling very well, and then it sort of dropped off when summer started. Now, what triggered that sale? What about the ad? Because we want to talk to them about, I think, what works in that ad. I hired a graphic artist. And he took my book cover and he it actually did an amazing job. Um, took my book cover and then made like a black crow on a cemetery headstone. And the effect looked really, really good. I used that image in the ad and then I kind of studied copywriting. So I wrote a very teasing blurb. And then I have a great teaser um, one line enticement to learn more about the book. So I put that in there and that ad just I started keeping an eye on it and it worked very well. So would you say SEO is a part of that? And yeah. for those who don't know, SEO is search engine optimization. And what that basically means is when you use certain keywords, when somebody else randomly searches for XYZ keyword on Google, her book pops up. So is that part of that? I done? use SEO in my book descriptions on Amazon, but not necessarily in the Facebook ad, because Facebook ad, you're targeting who it's going to. It's actually a brilliant marketing yeah. it's, thing it's that does very well. I can narrow it down to women in Alabama between the ages of 40 and 65 oh. who like books set on the Gulf Coast, like book that number is two, awesome. that you know, like ghosts, that like haunted things. You can narrow it down as much as you want, and it really does reach the people. So It really strokes home. You have to know your target market. <laughs> if you do not know your target market, start over, because you've got to know who they are, because that's the source of how you're going to pick, how you're going to do paid ads, how you're going to write your copy, how you're, how you're going to do everything is all about that target market. And yeah. you can drill down so far. It's yeah. scary <laughs> what they know you like. Yeah. They know you better than you probably do. Yeah, so knowing your keywords is very, very important. You get down to the, the search engine op optimization, and it, and it filters into uh, even even if, if you're allowed to, depending on how you're doing your publishing, if you have the opportunity to choose the 
the series name, if you can work keywords into the name of your series, like with the Whitechapel Paranormal Society. Whitechapel and Paranormal are things that there are keywords that bring certain readers, they have certain expectations with those words. Yeah, but Whitechapel to me is a death metal band out of Tennessee. <laughs> so let me ask you this question, because we're talking about keywords, how do you find that keyword, number one? And number two, how do you balance because I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys are going to want to know this. How do you balance doing the SEO, doing the marketing, learning all that um, nonsense? How do you how do you balance that with um, the craft of writing? So you're getting the book done, you knock the novel out. You're you 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 can you you're considering that it's a fantastic novel. You know it'll sell, but SEO has to be a thing. Well, I know one place you can find keywords is you can go over to the Google Ads and Google AdSense, and you do not have to complete the whole process of actually purchasing an ad through them, because actually Google Ads do not work very well for marketing books, but you can go there and find which keywords have X number of people searching on Google, and that's a great place to start. You can also go to the um, Amazon Kindle account, log out as you go to it like a public user, and put go into the Kindle store and start putting words that resemble your novel and see what comes up. They will show you a list of keywords of what the public is searching for. So if, in my case, ghosts, haunted house, I might t start typing in haunted and I'll see haunted house haunted mysteries, haunted whatever. So I try to use those in the Amazon description because I know people are searching in the Kindle store for it. Yeah, we use both of those in publicity, um, both the category-based ones for Amazon and the Google AdWords, um, the keyword finder. We use both of those for that. So they're both really helpful tools. And the keywords for Amazon is really helpful because um, it's really a breakdown of the categories. So it gets an idea of how to find your audience too. Fantastic. Quick question. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, this brings up an interesting dichotomy between SEM and SEO. Right. And what would you all say with the, like, your idea of being where the people would be who aren't necessarily looking for a book, but they engage with your book? You're, you just talk about people looking for books, Amazon, they're searching, now they're going to find. So being there, you know, where the, where the community is, engaging at, oh, they never intended to buy a book, now they're buying your book. How would you balance those two things and where do you see so what's that, more effective under I, what circumstances? I would look, we always identify like the three or five books that are similar, but we can also look at media that is similar. So for historical romance, if I have someone who really loves Outlander, then I can target them with a book that will help them get through their Outlander um, while they try to wait until the next season. So um, finding other fandoms that kind of have a crossover can really help. You do need to kind of, oh, I'm sorry. I no, you're good. Um, I run Facebook ads and one of the suggestions was to try to find similar audiences mm -hmm. like she's saying. <clears throat> It's kind of an experimental process. I did spend some money boosting ads because some of my books are like certain other authors, but those ads never really did well, and I got very frustrated. And a lot of my books are set in New Orleans, and they're ghost stories. So I simply Googled authors who write stories set in New Orleans that are paranormal, and I, I came up, that yeah. and I came up with two didn't really tend to, but came up with two best-selling names, and I've run ads with those names targeted to those fans, and those ads have been gold. Mm -hmm. They just have brought in a ton. So if your writing is similar to Michael Connolly or you know anybody else, you would target fans of that, and then in the ad say, like Michael Connolly's books, then you might enjoy blah, 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 blah. Um, so you can, you can say, for example, because I know she's not here this year, but you can say, for example, my books are kind of like Laurel K. Hamilton's, yeah? Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful how you phrase it. Though. Well, that's true. You, and yeah. that's another reason to network. The best thing you can do is if you network and meet actual authors who write those books that are similar to yours, you can get them to give you quotes. And yeah. that can be, that's even better than gold and saying, my book sound, it, it feels like Laura K. Hamilton's instead of having somebody say, hey, here's a great book, go read it, you're gonna love it. 
You can also uh, select other authors, people who like to read that those authors, in the background of some of these ads. Like in Goodreads ads, you select it, but the readers themselves never know that you selected that. And I've had them thank me for sharing my information with them, which totally surprised me on a paid ad. They're like, thank you so much for telling me about this. I'm going to get this book. And I'm like, wow. Because you sound like somebody else, and they think that they like somebody else, so they didn't buy you, yeah? Uh, yeah, so it works. paid ad works. <laughs> we tried the uh, Google paid promotion for pages, and it just it didn't go anywhere at all. It brings in a lot of non it just they're random names but they don't seem to be followers and the ad works for a bit and then it just dies and we've tried periodically to see if it can get better my husband's the IT guy but we talk about how to work a strategy to promote books and he can handle it because he's got all the IT knowledge and I kind of don't <laughs> but he will explain what he's doing and we're like okay well we have to approach it this way are we we should try these keywords and when we're listing something on Amazon we'll try to narrow down what categories would be the most, you know, beneficial for that book. Uh, but the problem was that at one point, some of my books risked being pulled because people were mistagging their books. They were putting erotica in the children's section because it would bump their sales in a search and come up. So Kobo or um, in the UK or something wiped out an entire category of books because people were mistagging them. So you have to be super careful when you tag stuff. Now, does this go across the board for Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, well, I, as soon as you mentioned Twitter, I'm thinking hashtag. And okay. hashtag is very similar to keywords. You can hashtag a keyword. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with hashtags, it's like the pound sign and then the word with no spaces and no symbol, other symbols. And, but also you can go on something like Twitter and see what are the popular hashtags of the moment and you can see what are popular hashtags in your genre and for other writers and for readers there's things like am writing or friday reads that are very very popular so that's a great a great way to bring more people to your feed we have as writers as a particular group on facebook and we're called night writers because we are the crew that tends to be working at night and i've actually been able to coin the phrase in the fray which is courtesy of Dragon Con a few years ago, I saw Cell Dweller perform, and he played Switchback, and in the lyrics, in the fray is a word, so if you're in the fray, you're knocking the words out. So talk to me real quick about what's worked best for you and why, and then we're gonna go up to Q&A. What, what do you mean? <laughs> what's, what's been the best like, which social media platform has worked best for you and why? Like, has Facebook been great to you? Has Instagram been good to you? I get a lot of traction organically on Instagram, even though I tend to post book and cigar photos. I'm a diehard cigar smoker and a diehard drinker, but a lot of times you're going to see that there's a bourbon and Christina Dawes' latest novel, <coughs> some other romance authors on my Kindle because I go to the cigar club here in Atlanta once a week and I bring my Kindle and I read. So what's worked for you girls? Tumblr, uh, Twitter, and Instagram is starting to pick up the speed for me too. And it's, I think it is largely the hashtag um, ability of a lot of people to get their words out there. Yeah. 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 It's working. So see how long it works. So what's the hashtag you, you, you um, use? It depends. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, support indie authors or indie reading or you know, an indie review group that we had going over the summer. There's different ones that have come up and, and gone. They come back. So it, it depends what the group has decided to use. So. And I think Instagram is the place for hashtags right now. And you can find a group using hashtags on Instagram faster than you can anywhere. And even Twitter right now. And if you have really? like, oh yeah. yes, absolutely. absolutely. So if I post a picture of my cute puppy, he happens to be a men pen. If I do hashtag men pen, I get a ton more people that will follow me, will talk to me. If I just put hashtag dogs of Instagram, which there are millions and millions of those, yeah. I get a little feedback but I get a lot more by being specific. It's all about the target market. So the hashtags, you can use up to 30 of them on an Instagram post these days and people do it. And if you can find like what they're similar with, with the author I'm working with, she's in romantic suspense. 
She has an FBI agent in her. She has a DEA agent. I have followed the Navy. The Navy has followed us back now. That's <laughs> awesome. I was like, yes, my life is done now. NOLA, we, she had a yeah, set of NOLA. So I hashtag things, hashtag NOLA, hashtag New Orleans. Hashtag New Orleans. city settings of the books. Guess yes. what? New Orleans Visitor Center yeah. follows us now. Yeah. So you can so directly target. And once they see you're putting out content that's related to them, they want to be a part of that. It's just like when I got my business cards done, I tagged the business card company in there. And now they're following me, and they said something, and they re-grammed my picture. So it's all about, to me, all about hashtags on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Now lastly, how do you balance marketing on social media with getting your grind on? Meaning, as an author, you've got to knock out so many words a day, but then you still have to market. How do you balance that? It's difficult. They, they say the 80-20 rule, you're supposed to be 80% writing your book, 20% marketing and focusing on social media because the, the best, well, another author basically said who is a multi-millionaire has said the best form of marketing is the next book because you will always be, need the next book to reach more readers. However, I am one of those do as I say and not as I do <laughs> because it's hard. There are times where I, it, the marketing is fun for me. I would rather spend time on Facebook and Twitter and engage in conversations, you know, whether it's about the book or the book setting or whatever, than actual crank out the words. But I have to, you know. And how do you avoid getting sucked down the rabbit hole? Uh, it's difficult. Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> I have segmented lists. If I'm on Facebook when I'm working, then it is only book Facebook people I'm looking at. Same with Instagram. Not Instagram because they don't let me do that yet. Same with Twitter. Instagram is gonna let me do that one day, and it's gonna be the best day of my life. <laughs> but it's not there yet. Um, Twitter is. If I'm on Twitter during work time, it is all book Twitter. But it's not a hard sell, yeah. No. You're, you're still just shopping for the folks. Well, yes, but again, um, I'm a publicist, so I don't have to balance any of this stuff. I just do this all the time. And there are actually apps out there. If you have trouble with with setting certain limitations on your internet usage, there are apps that will actually disconnect you at a certain time and basically say, "Go write your book now." So, so if you have some trouble with that, you can you can set up apps, you can set up alarms. Uh, personally, I am very OCD, so I have everything on a very rigid schedule, and that's what works for me. But it's all it's a very personal choice. What works for everyone? Just find something that works and stick with it. Yeah. You can also schedule tweets and Facebook posts, uh, and that helps a lot, especially if it's something like a regular Throwback Thursday or Friday Read, something you know you're going to post about every week. You can sit down Sunday night and schedule out all of those. And TweetDeck, I find, is really helpful, but there's a, a few different tools for that. Tweet, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. TweetDeck, yeah. Tweet yeah. And double check your uh, Facebook page post. Um, you can schedule them through a software, see how they perform, but then also schedule them on the Facebook page. I'm going to bet that you see a different performance, and if you schedule them through Facebook, you're going to get better. So wait, you can actually schedule posts on Facebook too? On yes. four pages. Or a page, oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So let's explain real quick. On a page versus your own personal page, what's the difference? You can do advertising. You get analytics with a, a professional page. With a personal timeline, you do not. And people, you have to approve all of your friends on the Facebook, but you don't have to approve anybody who likes you on Facebook at your page. Sweet. Let's take some Q&A. How about you guys? Like that? Nice you, sir. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, got a soft box okay. for questions. Ooh. I hate that damn You box. got it. Oh. I know you hate it, but hey. Oh, <laughs> this is me. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're good. So, um, I, I think I get Facebook and Twitter fairly well, but um, Instagram and Tumblr, um, I don't. Um, so, what sorts of things do you post on your Instagrams and your Tumblrs? And more importantly, how do they help you acquire readers? I mean, Instagram seems to be photos. I can take all the food photos in the world, but... I'll try that one. Um, my Tumblr started out by me posting a lot of... The, I travel a lot, so I started posting a lot of pictures that I took on travels that I used in the book later on, or, you know, inspiration this character's costume, this little accessory of jewelry, this little bit of thing. It became like a little pack, um, pack rat. In a Tumblr page, and it just turned into my writing page, and that's, if I'm updating my writing or if I'm working, I usually kind of post there every few days, just, or read blog, you know, this is an inspiration here, or I liked this building when I was traveling, so now it's in the book, and 
Hmm. It's just where all the little ideas were coming from. And that's then cool. people just, yeah, that's where people start liking it and seeing it. And then I post the colors or, you know, at the events, I'll probably post a picture of that. Like, and this, it gives people an interest, um, an image of behind the scenes of what comes on with the book. So would you say the biggest thing about social media is letting folks connect with you? Yes. 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 The yes. social part of it is very important. So uh, with Instagram or with Tumblr, you could post um, really anything that connects you with that audience. So other books that you're reading, post a book of the, post a picture of the book while you're reading it, and get people talking about what they liked about that book, and get people connecting with you. Because then fans of that book that may be similar to yours will then follow you and see it when you post the cover of your book. I typically um, always, I don't know how my brain works, but I typically always think of actors and actresses as my cast <laughs> for my book. I really can't just make up a visual person in my head. So I tend to put Pinterest boards together as well as Instagram and say, you know, I was thinking about so-and-so when I wrote this character, and readers really like that. Even if they envision someone totally different, they sort of want to know the behind the scenes of what were you thinking about when you wrote him, and who did you envision him? So. You can do that with world building too. Yeah. If, if oh you're, yeah. You know, say say it's even a fictional city in an urban fantasy setting. You can show pictures of, in my case, with Harbor's Mouth. It's a it's a Frankenstein version of Portland, Maine, and Quebec, and Dublin, Ireland. So you can post all of those and have it in your world building uh, Pinterest board or, or hashtag it and let people know. And it gives them, yeah, they get to go behind the scenes and, and get inside your writer brain a little bit. And people like that. It, 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 again, you're getting that interaction. People are more involved with the series and then they're, they're more invested in the series. Well, and I think also if if they're interested in something and they're a reader, maybe they haven't found you yet, but you're posting about your cigars and yeah. your bourbon, and they mm -hmm. love cigars and bourbon, and that's a part of your story, then they may pick up your story because like, yeah, I like that, maybe I'll like his character too. Or, or they'll tag their friend who's just a bourbon fanatic and would love to read that book. And so I think it's that way of trying to find similarity. I've written a lot of characters that have um, in the old world fashion when men could get away with getting tight every night and not being a problem and I am I'm an avid bourbon drinker but not because of the obvious but because the culture around bourbon drinking and the culture around cigar smoking is so different than what we're growing up with so when I post on on Instagram a lot of times it's it's a cigar and then a copy of the of a screenshot of the Kindle book I'm reading, whether it's EJ's or I did that with you, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. And, 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 fr and from the cigar shop I was at, which is local, so I got the locals, I got the cigar bar, I got the cigar smokers, I got the bourbon drinkers following me now on Instagram because I'm a drinker and I like what they like. Keep in mind also, I don't let you get to your question in Go just ahead. a second. Oh, yes. Keep in mind also that the internet is worldwide. Um, I got readers in South Wales and the UK that by is awesome. posting thank you. Um, by posting things about New Orleans and NOLA because they were big Anne Rice fans and when they saw the hashtag of NOLA and started following me and were asking me questions about what's it like, I grew up there. So we just sort of chatted back and forth and then they picked up my books. So you can, you know, definitely do that. Question. Yes. I don't know whether I'm, I'm following up on his question, and I don't know whether I'm revealing my age or my lack of IT. It's all gravy, it's all cool, doesn't matter. Uh, experience, but I just don't understand either um, Instagram or Tumblr. I've tried to follow people, I have accounts on both, I've tried to follow people. I don't, I literally don't understand how to use it. So I guess this is Tyra, a question for Tyra. Yes, ma'am. Do you explain that in your book? <laughs> yes, actually we do. Um, so um, Instagram, the thing, and what you have to find out is what, how do people communicate in the community? So I always tell people, if you don't want to talk to people, go to Pinterest. Because all we want to do is post pens and read them. We don't want to talk to each other. I just kidding. I just kidding. There's no comments. Commenting is like 0.2% of what happens. No. And on Instagram, on it's Tumblr, very similar. It seems like comments are two Tumblr words. is very group-oriented. Okay? Is it? 
I think so. I think it's very good. I've only seen it in the I've only seen it on Tumblr, so I mean, I don't know. <laughs> there are other communities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> still, that porno is coming from other people who care about the same kind of porn that you care about. So you're still having a community around that based on other people's There's no like official like, community page. There are just people who. Right, they all build the into it together. Yes, sir, in the back. I have two accounts. I have one for my author page and one for my regular page. I'm always afraid of offending people by promoting too much. How do you get around that? Well, um, I guess, again, that's a matter of knowing your audience, uh, knowing what they're comfortable with. Don't post the same thing over and over. Don't just post buy my book, but there's nothing wrong with posting to your the people who care about you what you care about. So if you're writing, post that you're writing, and if you're saying my book was released today, or I got this great review, or I'm featured on this blog, then definitely share that with your personal page because they care about you and they want to know what's going on in your life. Make it well-rounded though, yeah. because, and, and that's why I try to bring in setting and character and um, maybe some sort of little famous spot or even in the second book my uh, protagonist restores old carousels and that's a very unique community and so I found a Facebook group that restores old carousels and just you know been talking about things like that even if you're not really interested in that that's typically kind of a thing where people are like oh that's cool okay and so just it, it, Find ways to talk about the book without directly saying, buy my book. But you can definitely say, you know, my book release is coming out. Readers, for whatever reason, are very fascinated to know when we write, how we write, where we write, what we eat when we write. I, I can't figure it out, but those are popular posts. <laughs> One last question to you folks uh, before I take the floor to the folks over there. How do you feel about emotional bleeding on social media? I have a bad habit of emotionally bleeding on social media, on, at least on Facebook, and otherwise I don't do it. But how do you feel about that? I like my authors to be people. Um, I don't want them to be robots. So there's, you know, I don't want long, rambly, vague booking posts by any means, but I'm Now when you say vague booking, you mean what? You know, when you post something that doesn't directly say what it is, like, oh, today was so hard, and it's just everything keeps building up and I don't know if it's ever going to get better and then you never tell anybody what's actually going on. That's vague booking. But I don't, want, I don't want any of that. I want them to be people though. So if they had a terrible day, then talk about your terrible day. Like be a person. Be you. But don't be a drama llama. No, absolutely not. I mean, don't, don't always post it. Unless you're writing books about drama llamas and you have readers that are drama llamas. If you're 18 and it's angsty, then that's probably fine. You. So when you're trying to market yourself online, you're obviously building a brand, like this is who I am, this is who I write. And the, the feeling on different social media um, can be different. Like I would never talk about on Tumblr or something that I talk about. There are things that I don't talk about between the two sites. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you keep your brand consistent when you're marketing on Facebook and you're marketing on Twitter and you're marketing on Tumblr so that you, you're, you're recognizably, recognizably the same person, but you are still engaging with Branding. Good question. Yeah. I, keep my, uh, I keep all my social accounts somewhat separate. My personal Facebook page is mostly family and friends. All the other ones I tend to approach as if I'm the author, so I try to contain the stupid behind the Facebook or privacy filter so that nobody has to realize, oh my god, she's completely nuts. <laughs> so you, you kind of self-filter for each thing. You're, you're showing them a part of you. Like everybody on all my social media knows what I write. Only the people on my closest friends page know that, you know, I, I've had a really rough day or, you know, other personal stuff going on. So you, you sort of pick and choose what you're going to divulge on each um, uh, social media aspect. I said know your audience thing again, um, because you need to know who your fans are, but you also need to know where they are. So you're going to talk to the people on Tumblr slightly different than you talk to your Facebook fans. And just keep them in mind with every post. And Twitter limits what you can post as far as 140 characters or whatever it is. So. Well, and branding. So, like, when you go and look at any of my accounts, you know it's still the same person because I'll still have a very similar profile picture. You'll see my brand logo there. So that I think that can help bring all of that in. And when you go to the website, 
it looks the same. So you don't go, is, well, nobody's going to go that with Tyra Burton probably, but um, it's like four You're of us. You're all going to go. <laughs> but, but there's like four Tyra Burtons. But if you have a more common name, you want to make sure if somebody follows your name, they know exactly when they see it. And part of that to me is image. In the back. Yeah, um, I thought I can't even tell. Oh, there it is. Um, so specifically Twitter, um, I've used the hashtag amwriting. I love it. It gets a lot of feedback. Word up. Um, and I find that when I use hashtags like that and other things, I will get these random people following me, um, which, I mean, to a point is great, but I, when I go and look at their profile, it's usually more indie writers that are trying to do promotions for their books. And I don't know if I'm just weird, but I kind of get a little annoyed by it. Well, the problem is they're not here. Huh? The problem is they're not in this panel. No, um, but I'm just wondering, I mean, is that, uh, I mean, is that a good tactic? I'm just weird that that's annoying or um, like, what is a good way to find people other than just letting them find you? Does that make sense? Yes, and you're, I, I don't think anybody likes the annoying Twitter feed of, you know, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. Um, well, and this was brought up earlier in the social media thing, but um, try to tweet different things around what your book is about. I've actually had to, I, I don't know if it was on your blog or not. I've actually written blogs where we are not allowed to talk about our book, <laughs> but we are allowed to talk about something related to the book. That was a fantastic exercise. I can't remember if that was your blog or not. On my blog, we do paranormal road trip. So instead oh, of yeah. focusing, yeah, instead of it focusing on the just on sell it, you know, buy my book, buy my book, we go to the location yes. where the where the book or series is set, and we talk about the top five spooky places in that in that location. And that brings in a lot of new readers because they're really fascinated with with learning about the ghosts and the spooky haunted places in that place. And you have people who are interested in travel who come and read about it. But you, you are still targeting people who are interested in the paranormal. Right, and there's like a link at the bottom to your website or whatever, but that's sort of a backdoor way of getting people interested. A lot of people follow me on Twitter that have, Lord knows, all kinds of profiles, and a lot of them I block, and a lot of them I, mean, I just do you think don't think that's wise for them to do? To, uh, for people no. to just like follow a million people and hope that they look No. Okay, I no. don't think so, because that's kind of annoying. <laughs> no, if you find people who are interested in the things that you write about, then you should follow them. Right, yes. reach out to them. And since you're hashtagging am writing, they may be going, oh, she's a writer too. So that yeah. could be part of it. And yeah. I, I understand that part of it. It was just like, Okay, we have weird kind of style of writing, so nothing that I'm writing now. I, I actually get, and this is confusing to me because normally when I'm on panels here, I'm on adult panels after 11 p.m., and I speak a lot more authentically. Uh, Colorfully. 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 Yes, thank you. <laughs> Colorfully. That being said, I get a lot of readers who are not my target market follow me on Facebook. They're they're devout Christians or they're devout this or that or whatever. And it confuses me because I'll put out a hashtag and then they'll come back with me and follow me and I, I'll take a look at their profile and I'm like, what are you even thinking? <laughs> and I get that there's a separation because of what I told these ladies earlier about my readership initially being in the Midwest and the ebook trend that came out, which I'll talk about after the panel, but I want to get to his question first. So I have a double header, um, very quickly. Uh, when you're doing your social media analytics, what are the key metrics that you use? Is it reach or engagement? That's a great question. And then second, um, if you could all just name someone or a few people, it doesn't even have to be authors who you think have an exemplary uh, social media practice. Ah, yeah. I can't stand Jeffrey Jarvis' social media feed. I love the guy. I had him. I picked him up on uh, Tim Ferriss' blog, uh, blog uh, post a while back. Love the guy for what he is, but politically, he is the worst person for me to follow because all he does is basically trash talk the other candidate and talk about the country that it's with. But that being said, he's got over a million followers, and I want to know what he's talking about. So he's someone that I just. 
I still, I can't turn him off. Because when he asks a question, I want to be engaged because I'm still a reader too. So if he's going to post a statement, I'm going to interact with him and we'll talk for a minute back and forth on Twitter. Let the rest of you guys go. Metrics. Are we starting? I was very excited. We want to start down there. It works this way. Uh, She's checking her Twitter feed. My right? yeah, I, I just posted on Instagram. So. <laughs> uh, I think we're all doing that, trying to find our favorite. <laughs> but uh, metrics wise, I compare the two. Um, if it's shown to a lot of people but nobody clicked on it, then that tells me that I did a terrible job with the ad and I need to uh, rework my copy or the image I'm using. Um, if it's not shown to a lot of people, then I need to expand the audience. But if it's shown to a fair number of people and a fair number of those clicked on it, then I know I'm doing well and maybe I can reach out to more. But it looks like the ad is still working really well. Exactly. And I personally, I find keeping spreadsheets on all of the numbers, the metrics, uh, watching that and watching trends and even things like time of day and time of the year, all these things are really important. And, and if you keep spreadsheets and charts, you can actually watch patterns emerge and then really fine-tune fine, fine -tune your marketing and your social media presence and see exactly what's working. Yeah. You oftentimes have to combine things. So like if you're doing a click one and it's taking them to the website, so you have to look at the the, the social media analytics, then you got to look at the Google analytics, and then for the author we were doing on it, she also had to go and then compare that to what was happening on Kindle. Uh, she's on Kindle Unlimited. So we had three sets of analytics that we had to look at kind of in a sliding timeline. So it, it can't be hard, but make sure you capture all the, the road there. I love Google Analytics. I, I think it's fabulous to find out where your social media traffic comes from, to which page of your website to uh, Facebook ad analytics as well as how many people clicked on it versus how many people bought that day. Mm -hmm. I can see my sales every day. I actually do that every morning over iced coffee. And that's uh, your ROI. Yeah. Well, I'm always in the black. I don't know the exact ROI, but I look at my sales every morning so I can see if something hit on a certain day or not. Google Analytics was actually really fascinating when I found out where most of my audience was coming from, what ages they are, the fact that a lot of them come from Pinterest, which surprises me. I do have, I mean, Facebook and Twitter are my two main platforms, um, but I did have, um, I did have a large following come from Pinterest. And I do have a, a board for each book where I put actors and actresses and settings and anything cool that I just might see on Pinterest because Pinterest is fun. Um, but yeah, definitely it's good to keep it at. And everything, like EJ said, is cyclical. There are months where people do not really buy books. There are months when people are so busy getting kids back to school. Or you do the summer whatever. months are slower. Some months are slower than summer others. Months. Yes, August is awful. Don't ever release a book in August if you can help it. Yeah. Live and learn. And you were um, asking about people to follow to look at. Yeah. I actually think nonprofits are a great place to go and look because nonprofits don't often have money to drive engagement through social media. And through them, if you can see what they're doing, that's bringing them people in organically. Peace, uh, Love and Pause is one of my favorites on Facebook. Um, they do, they're very consistent in a post they do every week with uh, the puppies doing a tip of the day. But find your favorite nonprofits that are doing really well on social media and, and emulate that the best you can in a profit sense. Because they just don't have the money. So they're gonna sit there and work at it until they figure out what actually connects. What clicks. Yeah. 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 In the back, please. Yeah. Um, thanks for putting the panel together. This is awesome. Um, I'm about to publish my first book. Congratulations. Uh, obviously, on Amazon. Uh, I'm kind of broke. But, um, it's all good. One of the things I w I'd like to know is I'm, I'm pretty good with SEO, and I, I've got a really good Twitter following on one of the sites that I do. It's not in my name. It's just a, a site. Um, what has been the most successful social media platform that has transacted you the most business? That is an as, awesome question. As far as like followers, I, I feel like, like 8,000 followers on Twitter. Now, and it's a very niche, niche market. I, I know my audience really well. Um, but, you know, like what platform has actually bought the book? I, I switched because Facebook. I used to be on Twitter for a while and I was diehard on Twitter but then I ended up on Facebook and, and, and like these ladies have said, Facebook has been what's been big for me. 
and Facebook ads as well is one of the best. So Facebook? Facebook, yeah. Facebook yes. Yeah. Twitter, I've connected with a few people in other countries and it's been great to sort of exchange info and I think I have three that I know of, readers on Twitter, <laughs> all in other countries surprisingly. But um, yeah, Facebook and Facebook ads. It can depend too on when you when you began tweeting or, or putting posts in this particular place because I, I still have a strong following on Twitter yeah. and it still works for me. But I know that if if I'm giving advice to someone who's just creating an account or just starting to get their books out there, that I would not recommend that being where you begin. But if someone has been doing it for a while, I, I think it's worth continuing to do if you have yeah. time. Are those all Facebook pages or groups? Pers they, they personal uh, right. timeline personal. And, and, um, and groups are what work for me better on Facebook. The pages just don't have the reach anymore. They don't have the reach, but I think you should still have one. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 still have one. Definitely. And, and, and even on the, the platforms that work, still try to get it. <coughs> It's still in time management, but if you ha can can work the time into your schedule and still be able to, to get your books out there, then I recommend being as, in as many places as possible. And Second to last. Um, so uh, I write nonlinear, sometimes choose your own path fiction. The nature of that is very segmented. Um, what are your thoughts on posting small snippets of what you're writing directly what you're working on. Uh, I love it personally. I actually get a lot of feedback like from that. <laughs> I use I use uh, I found Wattpad, which actually started bringing more readers home. Wattpad? Cool. Wattpad? Wattpad. Wattpad. W A T T P A D. It's a, a website. And it turns out it's actually Toronto based, which is kinda of cool. Um, and it's started to pick up speed again too. I posted a short story that I wrote last year for a reading at Dragon Club and it's just starting to take off on its own now. So, because we've got more books coming out with it, yeah. it's a good place to put the short stories where I can't do anything else, but it gives people a little bit of my work to tide them over. So, Just be careful if, if this is a, a work that you are planning on submitting to a publisher. If you go and put things out on social media, anywhere on the internet, technically, that what you've put out there is published. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really careful. Yes, be really careful if this is something. It's a little bit different if you're doing self-published because you have that control. But you don't you don't want to cut off your legs. Are you no, like destroying your option to do that in the future if that it isn't in my can. right now? It depends yes. on the it editor in question. As an editor, I don't necessarily care. I want you to budge your audience as much as possible. As an author, I'm also careful because of the editors I'm targeting. But that being said, like they said earlier, it is still technically publishing. So maybe you tag it with thing like, I don't know, this is a, a work in progress or a, a hashtag that works for that, yeah? Just be really, really careful. Yeah. We usually pick around three excerpts that we have the editor approve, and those are the ones that are okay with being shared. And that'll be like a 800 word or so excerpt, and then we have paragraph ones that we use as teasers on social media. That being said, though, if you are going to self-publish, um, readers love it, especially for a pre-order, and that can up your pre-order sales if you publish like the first page, chapter, whatever. Readers love it. Now, last question, you. What's up? How do you make connection with a an audience really outside your own demographic? I know Elaine writes for women's fiction. Or, or ghost stories that, that appeal is my a lot to, uh, to people like me, uh, like you, right? Um, I write young adult fiction. I so mimic. How do I, as an old person, make connection with I my mimic. readers? I mimic and I follow my friends who were inspirational to me, and I talk to them because they were inspirational, and being a male romance author, I basically, um, what's the word looking for? Uh, well, yeah, I, I mimic. Who, what are my friends posting? What are my female romance authors posting? What are they talking about? It's a little more difficult for me to post a guy, you know, hot body guy, than it is to, like, for you, for example, possibly. But I, try to find my own version of what I consider a classical male, and in my particular world, that tends to be like Cary Grant or one of those guys, and I still get a lot of, I still get a lot of, a lot of um, following on that, but I parrot. I would say find influencers. 
Absolutely. That Excellent point. Because, like, I, I teach social media. I'm on every social media channel. I try Snapchat, but I'm 48 years old. I suck at it. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. But I teach 18-year-olds, so I need to know what it is. But if I need a message to go out on Snapchat, you better believe I go find one of my 18, 20 year olds to go do it for me. Yeah. So find influencers within that target market that like you and get them on a street team and get them talking in those channels about it. And those 18 year olds are still on Facebook. They're just on Facebook for a different reason. So have a presence there too. They'll still find you. But find you some influencers on their platforms. And it's not, it's not as useful as it used to be, but you can still go to clout. The K. Oh, oh yeah. wow! Uh, it's it's old, but, it the, old. but you can still can get. It's like three it. years old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is. <laughs> but yeah, you can go you can go there as a place to look up influencers. All right, we're we're uh, out of time, right, Scott? Okay, so let me get and I need a loud, raucous thank you for my panelists. <laughs> I hear you. Need a loud, raucous thank you for the EFF track for hosting us. And uh, yeah, I guess we're out. Yes, Scott. We're, yeah, so come talk to us. Come catch us. Whatever. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you for coming. Oh, fine. You know what? I need you guys one more thing. Yes. I need you guys to give a loud thank you for being here. Sweet, thank you.